Hey everyone, this is Reese. Before we start today's episode, we'd be remiss to not mention COVID-19 and its effect on people around the world. Firstly, we hope you and yours are safe and healthy and following the best practices for staying that way. Washing your hands, socially distancing yourself from others, etc. If you want more guidance, go to cdc.gov for more information and the New York Times is offering its COVID-19 coverage for free during this pandemic. I really encourage everyone to stay educated and take an abundance of caution in your approach to your daily life. We here at the WSL are also taking an abundance of caution, and we announced that we're canceling or postponing all of our events at least through the month of May. We believe that's the right thing to do for our surfers, our fans, and our staff. This of course means we're bummed we won't be seeing some of our partners and friends around the world as usual, but we still have the internet, and now more than ever, it's important that we leverage our online communities to stay connected support one another, and continue moving forward as best and safely as we can. After all, as Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia, says, the cure for depression is action. So if all of this has you down, find that one thing you can do to help and lean into it. We're going to keep delivering this podcast to the best of our abilities, and we're exploring new ways we can share our mission to protect the ocean. We hope you'll stick with us, and together we'll get through this. If you have ideas, send them our way. Okay, now for this week's episode. From WSL Pure, this is One Ocean. Hey everyone, today we're going to hear how Australian activists are giving a voice to ancient forests that are under threat. This week, we're bringing you a special discussion on a very topical story led by one of our WSL Pure ambassadors, Ace Bucken. If you're a fan of professional surfing, you'll know that Ace is a veteran pro from Australia. And if you're a fan of Ace, you know that he stands for more than just competitive surfing. He's been outspoken about plastic pollution, the climate crisis, the youth environmental movement, the recent bushfires in Australia, and more. And I can tell you from my own experience getting to know Ace the last couple of years that he is passionate about protecting the planet. So it was no surprise to me when I got an email from him and his longtime friend and filmer Woody that they'd planned a trip to Tasmania to go scope out the Tarkine, which is a region known for its incredible ecosystem of ancient rainforests and more recently for the region's potential destruction. Playing host on their trip would be Peter Wish Wilson. Peter is an ardent environmentalist, a surfer, and the Tasmanian Senator of Australia representing the Green Party. On social media, he's aptly named Senator Surfer. At the time of their conversation, some of the Tarkine was under threat from logging, and environmentalists were holding a line in the sand to protect the trees and this ancient ecosystem from being cut down. And while we generally focus on the ocean on this podcast, it's important to recognize the connectivity of our various ecosystems. Ancient forests like the Tarkine store carbon, provide habitat and protection for biodiversity, and more. If we lose habitat like the Tarkine, there are downstream effects to our coasts and ocean. If you log a forest upstream, you increase runoff, which can kill reefs or cause other harmful effects in local waterways. And that's just one example. So we really applaud Ace for his initiative for following his instinct and taking time away from his family during the off season to document the issue. And we're proud to share his story here and the work of Peter Wish Wilson to protect this place. A quick heads up that this episode does have some swearing in it. So if you happen to be listening with kids, now's your chance for headphones. But without further ado, here's Ace Buckin and Peter Wish Wilson. G'day everyone, this is Ace Buckin. I'm a dad, a surfer, an environmentalist and a pure ambassador. And I'm sitting here today with Peter Wish Wilson, Australia's own surfing senator and Tasmania's green senator in the Australian Senate. Pete, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ace. It's been it's been awesome to meet you and and Woody and spend the last three or four days with you, seeing my uh, my beautiful state, home state of Tassie. No, well, thank you. It was uh, it was my first time down here. It's it's been somewhere that's you know been at the top of my list. Um, You know, I've travelled the world for the last twenty years, and unfortunately, I've kind of seen more of of the world than I have of my own country but you know it's something that I want to see in the next 10 years and the last four days has been an absolute thrill and just to discover some of these wilderness areas that need our protection and um, you know need our help um, has been a life experience for me. Um, I thought maybe to kind of kick things off it'd be interesting to hear about your journey to the Senate and to the role that you're playing now um, you know, not only in Australia's political climate, but as a surfer, as an environmentalist, and as someone who, 
you know, I think a lot of not only the Australian surfing community, but surfers in general all around the world look up to as a conservationist. Conservationist, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm wearing I'm wearing a Surfrider Foundation t shirt today that says yeah, conservationist. It's actually a pretty good, pretty good description. I mean, surfers spend so much time in the ocean. They, they, they should be natural ambassadors for our environment. We should and, be. I mean, we get so much joy. We've got to give something back. Surf ride. That's been surf riders' basic philosophy. But yeah, look, I've had a. I, I suppose I've had a pretty non-conventional, uh, you know, ride. Let's call it that. Um, Your journey is in, pretty, politics. pretty yeah. interesting when you kind of go back and, um, you know, look at the way you got there through through the military and, you know, through Wall Street. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Well, look, I've just been a lot of different people throughout my life. It's all it's been all about the journey. And, um, yeah, look, after after school I wanted to fly helicopters, so I joined the Army and um, that kind of wasn't for me. I got, I got medically discharged out of the Army after a parachuting accident and then was a bit lost and went and worked in the mines, saved some money, travelled the world, fell in love with a French girl, spent some time over there, bounced in nightclubs, did different things. Um, came back to yeah, came back to Oz. Decided I didn't know enough about the world. In fact, I knew bugger all. So I went back and did a master's degree. Um, and then you know times were pretty tough back in the economy back in the early 90s. And I got my first job in banking, and that was just the only job I could get at the time. And I took it and I ran with it. Ended up going all the way to New York. And although it wasn't for me, I learned an incredible amount about about people and human behaviour. And 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 I started kind of looking at things differently and. Um, you know, 9-11, I worked in Wall Street, and uh, including that down in the World Financial Centre. And, um, you know, I talked about this in my first speech in the Senate, but I made a big, big decision to change my life. It was probably the bravest decision I ever made, looking out the window of the South Tower of the World Trade Centre, decided that I wasn't going to stay in New York. I was going to take a job back in Australia because I wanted to go home and be, go surfing and do the things that I love doing. And I was kind of a fish out of water in New York and um, that I'd marched the sound of my own drum. And it still took me a few more years to get out of working in banking, but um, you know, I had a young family. But when the Iraq war came along, that was the final straw for me. My first protest march I ever participated in was in Sydney against the Iraq war. And I slipped off to Tassie to, to grow, grow some wine and bring up my young family. Some damn fine wine, if I don't add. <laughs> yeah, thanks, mate. I'd, uh, I'll make sure you guys get, get a couple of drops for your bag when you leave tonight. <laughs> We've put no, a few no, away you know, on this trip. Um, but yeah, you know, it's uh, and, and moving to Tasmania, you know, you realise you, you can run from the world, but you can't hide. Um, I, in my little valley where our family farm was, we had a perfect point break nearby that I'd that I'd surf quite regularly, and I was just have, loving life. And a big aggressive timber company who wanted to build one of the world's biggest pulp mills, that had used you know four four million tonnes of old growth native forest every year, but you know it was going to dump thirty billion litres of industrial waste in the ocean where I surfed. And I thought, I've got to do something about this. So I got off my ass and I looked into it. And before I knew it, I was being pushed, pushed up front by people to, to campaign against this, this, you know, this, 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 this timber company and um, against the corruption in the government and against, you know, not wanting to lose a special place and see my state trashed. And before I knew it, it was 10 years of my life. It just it was like a black hole. It kind of sucked me in. But the, the benefits of all that have been huge. I've met these incredible people including, you know, uh, Bob Brown in the Greens and Christine Milne and other people that have become mentors for me. And I was an accidental politician. I've never interested in politics, never, never had an inkling I'd ever do something like this. But I figured I'd had a lot of life experiences and I had had a lot to offer. And I, I was one of these people that would just sit at home and throw shit at my TV and get angry if I didn't do something. And at least I have that platform now and I have that privilege of being able to have a go. So Absolutely. I'm lucky. I'm a lucky one. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I mean... <clears throat> it's a fascinating story and you know we chatted about it you know in on some of the road trips and many hours we've spent in the car kind of discovering this amazing state the last few days um, but in a lot of ways I think it gives your journey authenticity you know you haven't grown up and just inherited a set of political views that you've run with you've been shaped by these you know this myriad of experiences that you've had all yeah. over the world um, I think that's a really important point because I know there'll be a lot of people out there that'll be, you know, who'd, who'd be listening or looking at me going, you know, um, look, look at your background. There's no, everyone's journey into taking some kind of action to save the things they love, whether it's the ocean, whether it's fighting against climate change, whether it's protecting a local area, everyone's journey is different. Everyone comes at this from a different place and, and mine, I didn't start getting politically active till I was nearly 40. 
you know, like I had a good set of values and I had great, great, a great upbringing and um, some good role models, but I didn't actually start getting active till my 40s. So I was, like I said, I was a very different person in my 20s and 30s. Um, everyone can change. Every, everyone can take on board and decide one day that they want to do something and that, you know, that they've got to give something back. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. My, my old man didn't start getting politically active till his 70s. You know, like seriously, like it, that, that, that gives me hope. It makes me optimistic. Um, yeah, um, everyone, uh, one, thing I, one thing I've got in, I think everyone who cares and wants to, wants to take some kind of action, no matter what it is, the one thing they've all got in common is I think they've been touched by something bigger than themselves. Yeah. Well, look, you've mobilized certainly a lot of surfers, you know, over your time in the Senate. And you mentioned Bob Brown just before who, you know, he's almost a cult figure in Australia, certainly in Australian politics. And, you know, for those of us, of us that look at the Green Party, um, you know, to provide some leadership, certainly on environmental issues. Tell us a little bit about the role Bob's played in your life and how you come to actually replace Bob in the Australian Senate. Yeah, look, funny enough, I was going to run against the Greens in 2007 as an independent in that federal election, but I sat down with Bob and the Greens candidate at the time and I realised that, 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 you know, they were my people. They, they had the same values as me and that I'd just be taking votes off them and that, I, you know, I shocked a few people and said, I'm going to throw my towel in with the Greens and, and join them. Bob, Bob, he's just a very humble person. He's given, you know, 40, 50 years of his life and energy, very dedicated uh, to just doing what he can to to conserve nature and and protect the planet um and you know stepping into his shoes was a it was a big it was a big deal like a, there was a lot of expectation there um but you know i've he's, have, i've always had his help and the help of others like christine milne who's also been a uh, an incredible mentor to me and a, and a number of other people and we're you know we're, we're a movement we're, we're part of a broader movement of people very organic kind of structure but yeah bob bob just keeps it simple he never, he never really gave me much advice. He said, smile and look good for the cameras. So the <laughs> picture's worth a thousand words, you know, a few cliched things like that. It was pretty much like giving me the car keys saying, here, it's yours. But over the years, we've developed a, a great relationship and I, I certainly look up to him now and I don't pester him, but I do contact him when I, when I need some guidance and some advice. And he always says, I'm happy to give you advice, but you've got to be your own man. You've got to make your own decision at the end of the day. You know, and, and it's worth pointing out that, you know, Bob and, and a few others, uh, a handful of people, set up the world's first green political movement here in Tasmania. You know, the Greens have got the balance of power now in Europe. Um, there's a Green Prime Minister in Iceland. Um, they're gaining traction in, in countries all around the world. And it started here in little old Tassie. And, and they, were, uh, they were reluctant politicians. Nobody wanted to go into politics, but they got to a point where they felt like they had to. There had to be a political pathway forward to get change. And that was really burst with the with the Franklin River, Franklin right? Franklin Gordon, yeah. yeah, yeah, which was a massive campaign that brought in Bob Hawke and federal labour and um, brought the whole world. We had thousands of people come from around the world and protest and get locked up. The jails were so full here, they had no room for them. And I've seen those people 30 years later celebrating the Franklin and below Gordon being declared a World Heritage Area, drinking beers at the bar with the coppers that locked them up and everyone's patting each other on the back and having a laugh. <laughs> Nobody thinks it was a bad thing, the fact that we've got one of the great World Heritage Areas of the world now because a bunch of people got motivated and decided they had to make a difference. They had no choice. When the first elections came up, they had to draw names out of hats to become candidates because no one wanted to <laughs> no one wanted to volunteer so they said right we're drawing names out of hats i think bob got 128 votes in his first election he was a gp on a bicycle and he helped build a political movement to over a million a million votes in this country so it's a remarkable story and i've in inherited that legacy yeah no it sure is and you're certainly your own man and you're creating your own legacy um let's shift gears a little bit to the current political climate um you know, obviously we're in the middle of Australia's hottest ever summer. We've experienced our worst ever bushfires. Um, you know, Bob was recently quoted as saying that, you know, no leader since Bob Hawke has shown the political will to put our native places and to prioritise the environment over development. Um, you know, and that we're losing the po political will to protect our pristine places and our biodiversity is really suffering. Um, you know, we've got new protest laws that are about to go through the parliament, which are pretty draconian. Um, the, the most draconian in the country. Yeah. yeah, so talk a little bit about that and, and the effect that you think it could have. 
So, so look, you know, just uh, it's actually pretty simple, but the way I see it in my experience of having worked in, in business and industry and in the kind of engine room of capitalism, every environmental prob problem you can name up, and in fact most social problems, all come from an economic or business decision. They're all extent, what we call externalities, they're, you know, pollution, these kind of things, climate change, they're all caused by businesses and activities and at the root the root cause of you know of all of that is 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 profit is trying to make money and trying to drive the system and and you know I've run my own businesses my wife and I have run businesses and I've worked in that in that space and um, you've got to you know you've got to uh, you've got to kind of tackle it at its source and in Canberra um, all the warning signs have been there that we're going to have the hottest summer on record that we're going to have devastating fires we're going to have extreme weather events we were, expert report after expert report was been by a government that's only been series of governments that have only been intent on uh, you know representing the interests of their big their big political donors uh, and of course a very very conservative right-wing media that has a huge say in this country and makes it really hard for those who actually want to stand up for the environment. And so, so actually there's a much there, bigger, bigger picture here than... <laughs> you're talking yeah. about the Murdoch press and the, yeah. the oil and the coal lobby. The biggest lobby in Canberra, the two biggest lobbies are the Murdoch press and uh, in my opinion, and um, the oil and gas industry, the, the, the fossil fuel industry. There are others, of course, the, the, the broader mining industry. Um, you know, they not only donate to political parties, they're, they're, they're ferocious. Uh, lobbyists and advocates, they'll advertise against governments if they disagree with what we do. They'll spend millions of dollars on, on TV campaigns to back political parties who, you know, who advocate for their interests. And, and, and this is kind of, it, it's immoral and it's unethical and, in, and it's a form of corruption, but it's not illegal. It's actually part of our democracy we've inherited from the Romans. But that, so there has to be a counterpunch to that and a counterbalance. So and, do you think um, it's time we looked at, at these donations and... Reform political donations is critical. <clears throat> yeah. uh, a federal independent commission against corruption that looks at, you know, the advantage that's gained from this kind of thing. Um, and I think, you know, the voices that we're hearing rise all around the planet at the moment, especially from young people. Young people get me out of bed at the moment. It's what it is honestly what gets me through my day is seeing these gen young generations standing up going, this is bullshit, you know, like we, we don't want to inherit a burning planet. We don't want to inherit a dead ocean. So we, has that, it's has not that all galvanised about, you, you know, yeah, seeing these tens has. of thousands of people, yeah. you know, marching yeah. around the world? It has, mate. I, I saw the, uh, I, I went to the rally here in Hobart and, and I was, you know, I was just, just, so stoked to see how many people were out biggest rally in tasmania's history so bigger than the franklin below gordon campaigns you know the, the kind of things we always talk about that we're really proud of i got back to my room and i went on twitter and i saw one photo of the sydney rally and i started crying mate i was so emotional just just seeing that energy that there's people out there that have got your back that want to see change as well so when you when you do this job every day and you put up with a lot of shit and you get through that all but you it really it really yeah, it made me really proud, mate, That's you know, to really see that cool. there's people rising and they're, they're demanding action and that, you know, politicians have got to ignore this at their peril. And we were in the yeah. middle of the Tarkine forest the other day and we ran into two young activists yeah. who had marched in that rally. You know, That's kids right. under 10 who were up there with their parents just breathing in that pure fresh air and experiencing that wonderful wilderness that's under threat. And it is under threat. You know, <coughs> those forests that we, we visited, we, we visited a, a logging coop, what, 100, 100 metres from where those kids were looking at, a, at the lookout across the sumac forest. So any day now, those, those forests are going to be bulldozed and burnt. Yeah. Uh, you know, for, for what? For, to make, for, for, loss, for right? political gain, at, a, at an economic loss to the state. Yep. Um, uh, you know, for, for no value at all. And those, those are some of the most carbon rich forests left on the planet. Well, it's pretty remarkable yeah. that, you know, Australia is the driest inhabited continent on the earth, you know, um, and we've got well, one of the world's largest temperate, cool temperate rainforests down there in the Tarkine. Yeah. And we've totally just lost, totally we've unprotected. just lost, you know, tens of thousands of hectares this summer, yeah. yet we're going to allow logging of this pristine old growth forest that sequesters carbon. That's right. Breathes in carbon. Some of the most carbon out rich in the world. Yeah. And helps us you know, fight climate change and we're going to allow people to cut it down. It's just it's, madness. It's, it's insanity. Uh, the IPCC, so the best science we've got on this planet, said the most important thing we can do to reduce emissions is to save every tree. Plant more trees, yes, because as you say, Ace, those trees breathe in that carbon and they store it and they breathe out 
oxygen that gives life to us. Um, but these forest you witness are some of the most carbon rich on the planet and we're about to log them. Um, the state government here um, is in April, from April this year, is going to make available 350,000 hectares of beautiful old growth forest uh, to the loggers. And they've just, they're bringing in protest laws that are now before the upper house in Tasmania that will give a, an earth defender, someone who goes into those forests, you know, puts it on the line um, for a first offence, a similar criminal offence to, you know, to someone who, who murders someone. Like, you know, we're, we're looking at, um, for a second offence, five or six years mandatory sentencing. You'll get, you get less than that for murder in this state. It's and hard up to, to 18 years if it's private property. 18 years, that's a life sentence, man. That's three life sentences for someone who's looking after the planet. And this is because the government is representing a few powerful interests, not the interests of the people. Most Tasmanians, over 70% surveyed want to save the Tarkine. In some areas of the state, it's over 90%. Um, all around the country, I think most, the silent Australians <laughs> are, are, are Australians who actually want to protect nature and want to protect what we got left. Um, unfortunately, it's the powerful interests in Canberra and in state parliaments that are that are winning at the moment, and we've got a we've got a we've got a counterpunch to that. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, a quick break from our conversation to give a shout out to Outer Known. They sponsor this podcast because they care about the ocean too. That's shown in their clothing, which is all made from organic cotton, recycled and regenerated fibers, doesn't use a lot of water in the process or dyes, and is made by people who are paid a fair wage. I love their stuff. I'm rocking an Outer Known t-shirt that my wife gave me right now. It's super comfy, stylish, durable, and I feel good knowing that it was made responsibly. Outer Known was actually founded by pro surfer and 11-time world champion Kelly Slater, who was determined to create a clothing company who made clothing responsibly. And you don't have to be a surfer to wear Outer Known. It's really stylish. They have great threads for men and women, and you can go to OuterKnown.com today and enter the code OCEAN at checkout, and you'll get 25% off your full price order. That's OuterKnown.com, O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com, and remember to use the code OCEAN at checkout for 25% off. Check them out today, OuterKnown.com, and don't forget, promo code OCEAN for 25% off. Now, back to our conversation. Um, I mean, let's talk a little bit about Tasmania, and I think, you know, you mentioned the IPCC. Um, I think for, for me personally coming down here, um, part of the reason that I felt this kind of primal urge to come down to Tasmania was that it is really a microcosm of what's happening, you know, on a global stage in terms of climate change. The oceans are warming four times faster. You're losing a lot of that kelp. Um, the you giant know, kelp's pretty much gone from the, the, the yeah, the the salmon the farming obviously there's the tarkine um you know there's all sorts of issues down here um and tasmania has always been at the forefront of conservation yeah in australia um you know i think if if a lot of australians could come down here and just see you know this beautiful untouched wilderness that's kind of right beneath us down here you know um they'd yeah. feel they'd feel pretty different they would, and, and mate, good on, good on you for coming down. Seriously, when you when you, you got in touch with me and said, "How can I help?" and we had a discussion. The fact that you've given up, you both have given up. You know, a week of your life. You know, you're, you're training for the for the world championships. Uh, you, you've got a young family. You've got all this stuff going. On. The fact that you care enough to do this is really important. And and I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I know a lot of Tasmanians would, mate. So so good on you. Um, it's a sad irony that these. At the, you've seen a World Heritage Area to, while you've done this trip. You've seen the tourists it brings in, the money it brings in, the products, the, the, you know, the honey that's being made in these areas, all this stuff leveraging, and you've seen an area that's unprotected. And, and the sad irony is that even if we protect these areas now, um, climate change is still their biggest risk. We've seen three out of the last five summers, we've seen wildfires in areas that have never burnt for thousands of years from dry, increasingly frequent dry lightning strikes. So climate change is a big threat to Tassie's forest as it is uh, to the Great Barrier Reef. And, um, you know, I think, um, I think there's a lot, lot we can do to, to, to protect these areas. And um, I think when you talk about Tassie as being a microcosm, you're absolutely spot on, mate. But it's also going to be a microcosm, uh, a case study or it's highly symbolic for when we're trying to protect other places around the planet, the same kind of uh, obstacles that are going to be confronted in Tasmania are going to be confronted elsewhere. You know, the, the, the industries that want to keep these places unprotected, who want to mine them, who want to log them, who want to use them for a whole range of other 
you know, uh, same for the oceans, the marine protected areas. They're all, they've all been ripped up around the world, especially here in Australia, because of vested interests, you know. So you've actually seen a, a really important case study for what the whole planet's going to face in the next 10 years, especially if we're going to reach these, Absolutely. Uh, this goal of 30% to be protected by well, 2030. Let, let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, 2020, this year the UN's going to table this goal of, you know, what's being referred to as 30 by 30. Um, protecting 30% of our marine and terrestrial environments by the year 2030. Um, it's a lofty goal. It is, is it something you think we can achieve? And, and you know, what do you think are, are some of the things that are potentially tied to that? We spoke a little bit about um, climate change, you know, being included as, as kind of one of the things that's going to threaten those World Heritage yeah. listed sites that could potentially you know, take them off that list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's right. So look, it's going to be a challenge, but I, it's also not, it's not just the quantity. The, the, the 30% by 2030 is, a, is an ambitious target, but we have to have ambitious targets. So I think it's, it's a fantastic initiative, but you've also got to protect areas based on the best available science. A lot of what you see, 21% of Tassie has been protected. You've seen some of that. That's great, but you know what? A lot of that area excludes some of the most carbon rich forests in this state. They've deliberately excluded the forests because they want to log them, but we need those forests for to, to soak up that carbon. So they've got to be selected and um, they've got to be based on the best available science. Um, I think, um, you know, I think Tasmania, you know, it's, it's a good case study for the rest of the world. Um, if we added the Tarkine, I reckon we'd get to 30%. Yeah, well, Tim, Tim Flannery was quoted as saying that, you know, if the existing World Heritage Area, um, along with the Tarkine being added to that, he, he believes that it'd be in one of the top half dozen tracks of pristine world heritage area environment in, on the globe, yeah. you know, and I, I've now seen it for myself. And like you said, we walked up to Cradle Mountain and just, yeah. it was almost an otherworldly well, experience. We, we thought we lost you in the rainforest <laughs> yesterday. We couldn't find you. So we were, we're getting a bit worried. Um, <laughs> But it is the kind of place you can lose yourself in. It's so there's, there's that sound of silence, right? It's so yep. peaceful. It's, it's so powerful. It, it's so powerful. It has a physical a physical effect on you, and, the, and these areas are, are going to be subject to destruction. But you know, you know what might really help us get to that thirty thirty goal, thirty percent of the world uh, protected by twenty thirty. The World Heritage Committee next this year is going to meet in China, and areas that have been declared for their outstanding universal world heritage values. Tarkon, by the way, has been assessed as being world heritage and national heritage values. If the World Heritage Committee come out and say, the world's reefs, like the Barrier Reef, one of the great wonders of the world, and the Tasmanian forests, the 180,000 hectares of world heritage forests, um, if their biggest threat is climate change, and it absolutely is, then the, the values are threatened by climate. I mean, we've lost half the Barrier Reef already. That's a fact, you can't dispute that. Um, if they come out and say, these world heritage values are no longer going to have world heritage values if we don't do something about climate change. And they officially put these areas classified as in danger and they can do that. They can ring a warning bell and say, the world's reefs are in danger. Uh, the world's forests are in danger. That might just be the loudest global signal I can think of. If UNESCO come out and, and just say, if we don't act now, we are going to lose the world's most precious 28 reefs that are UNESCO listed and the world's most precious forests. We are going to lose them. If that doesn't spur political action and action on the ground, I don't know what will. And that is going to be a big thing this year that the world needs to focus on. And no one's talking about it yet, but I reckon that's a really, a really loud siren call for action. And I hope that UNESCO doesn't squib it and that they actually look at this and say, whichever way you look at it, climate change is the biggest threat to these areas. No, here, here. Well, um, you know, I think that that's something we'd all like to see, but how difficult do you think that conversation's gonna be when you look at, say, Australia and, um, you know, the, the pretty weak stance that our current government has taken on climate change, yeah. especially in light of, you know, what we've been through this summer. Yeah. Um, and then you look at, say, America and the stance that their leader's taken on climate change, how tough is it going to be for the world to take serious action when these countries that can afford to take action, because we can, yeah. simply aren't pulling their weight? They're not pulling <clears throat> their weight, and it's politics that's causing the problem. 
mean, yes, they're business and economic decisions, but that's when politics kicks in and protects those business and economic interests. Uh, and if you don't have a political pathway, you're never going to achieve 30% 30, 30 of the world protected. It has to be via by national parliaments and, and action by government. Individuals can do a lot of, a lot to help, but actually you need systemic change. And you know, if you look at Australia um, and you look at kind of the, how, how the government, I chaired a Senate inquiry into, the, into $444 million of taxpayers' money being given to a private foundation to manage the future of the Barrier Reef, a foundation whose board is full of fossil fuel companies. I chaired an inquiry into that and I know for a fact, and it's on record, that the government gave that money to that foundation to avoid a World Heritage in Danger listing this year, deliberately to avoid getting climate change brought into the equation because they're protecting our coal exports. They know that Barrier Reef is used as a, as a coal superhighway and that every time we export coal, we're burning we're burning a fossil fuel that's warming the planet and is helping kill the reef. And the Adani mines are going to accelerate that, isn't it? And they're absolutely on board, that, on board with oil and gas drilling in the Great Australian Bight. They're opening up... Um, off your coast, Ace, in your community, they're opening up areas now for seismic testing and, and, and gas drilling. They, they just don't get it. They, they, they honestly don't get it. Or if they do, they are criminals. They are because they are knowingly doing something that is going to impact the future of, the future of this planet and genera future generations on this planet. They cannot ignore what's happened this summer. They cannot ignore the, the millions of hectares that are burnt, the devastation to communities, the, the billions of dollars lost from our economy because of a lack of action on climate. It is only going to get worse. It is only going to get worse. Um, we've never seen a catastrophe in this country like we've seen this summer. It's off the charts. We are tipping. We are tipping really fast. This is the great disruption that people have predicted now. It's here. And in a way, we've got to, kind of, we've got to throw out the rule book. We've actually got to get people really, really active, uh, but it's got to be through political action. The only, the only things politicians care about are votes, sadly, at the end of the day. And if there's enough votes in it, and you know, we saw Damien Cole, an independent run in the last election in Karangamai in uh, Victoria. The whole federal election in this country, who formed government could have swung on one seat. And Damo, his, his, his preferences could have decided the fate of this country on an issue like drilling in the Great Australian Bight. Didn't quite work out that way in the end, but it came bloody close. And this next federal election, it may be an issue that we can get leverage on the, both the major parties who are absolutely in bed with fossil fuel companies. And we might actually make them listen because when their interests are affected politically, then they might act. There's, there's a really famous quote from a, 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 well, not, I think it's really famous, but it's <laughs> a, a favourite author of mine who wrote Chantaram, David Gregory Roberts. And he, th he said, there's only one thing that's more ruthless and cynical than the business of big politics. And that's what I'm in, right? Big politics in, in, in government. And he said, that's the politics of big business. And when the two come together, you have an unstoppable force. Well, we've got to stop them. We've got no time left. We absolutely have to stop them. Well, don't worry. They're going to hear about it. We're, we're not going anywhere. Um, look, you've spoken a little bit, I guess, about the role that politicians have to play. Yeah. Um, we've talked a little bit this trip about the role that, um, you know, surfers, musicians, actors and celebrities can play as activists. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, in the modern age of social media, um, the role that people who, you know, might not necessarily you know, see themselves as having a huge influence or necessarily being environmentalists can play and, and just how that can affect things. Yeah, like I think, I think going back to your early question, you know, like what, what can, how optimistic are you that we might get these, these, these really ambitious goals like protecting 30% of our country or Tasmania or the whole world by 2030. Um, raising education and awareness is absolutely critical. Um, allowing people to see what you guys have seen in the last four or five days, the, the positive things about conservation, the spin-offs, the, the benefits, um, and, and there are a lot of them. I mean, my state's humming now. We one of the, we used to be the, the, you know, the dog's breakfast economy in this country, and now we're now I think we're the second strongest economic state in the country because of tourism and because we save these areas. What you can do. Uh, and what I, 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 know, I know you're down here to do is, is, is highlight these things. And I think the role that influences and, uh, and, 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 and I'll, I'll call you a role model because you are a role model and a leader um, is absolutely critical. When I speak, I'm a politician um, and people go, oh, he's a politician, you know, he wants, he wants votes. Yeah, I want votes, but it's not for me. 
I mean, I, you know, it, it is because I want to save these areas and I want to look after future generations. But they're cynical nevertheless, and they should be because politics is at a really low ebb and we're on the nose. So we are really going to need, uh, you know, high profile people, leaders who actually care. Um, I think it's got to have integrity. Yep. I think it's good to highlight issues and to share things if you're, you know, if you're an influencer and you've got a big following and you know people, but it might tweak some interests and, you know, people are busy in their everyday lives and, you know, they, they it, it takes a bit to actually get them engaged. So I think consistency is really important. Yeah, yeah absolutely. They play I mean, a really important role. I think, and that was kind of part of the reason, you know, I get frustrated at times, obviously, um, you know, being a, <clears throat> a professional surfer or a professional athlete is, um, is a full-time job, you know, yeah. so um, you can share things, you can, you can post things, but actually having a tangible impact, like coming down here and documenting an experience and talking to the people on the front lines is something that I really wanted to do. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's some incredibly inspiring young acti activists out there, you know, you look at what um, Greta Thunberg yeah. has done and, um, you know, the girls from Bye Bye Plastic Bag in Bali. Yeah. Um, there's there's so, so many positive influences now around the world for young people to look at. Um, you know, as an athlete, it can potentially be daunting, you know, because you are undoubtedly going to alienate, you know, a section of your following by having a real clear stance on things. But, you know, I think, as you said, this is a tipping point. It's like the time is gone for people to sit on the fence. That's we right. need to really stand up for the things we believe in. Um, and, you know, as a parent and as someone that's got three young kids, yeah. you know, you you want them to have the opportunities to experience the things that we've been lucky enough to experience. Right. And yeah, we really do need to, to stand up for something and fight for it. <clears throat> but one thing I have noticed though, I, you know, like um, people may, 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 may not, they may get some offended at some level by your message or they, they may, uh, you know, they may react to that, but they, they often respect you if you've got a, a strong view on things and they respect, they respect consistency, even though they may not necessarily agree. Cause it, I mean, so obviously a lot of people who just don't have time to care and, and haven't really invested that. And I think that's that's the biggest thing we're facing. It's just that kind of complacency. Mm. The quit the biggest question you're gonna get when you when you when you raise these issues is what can I do to help? The people who do who do you who do click with it, they're gonna go, Ace, it's great, what can I do to help? And I, I get it all the time and it's kind of almost a plea for help from people because they deep down they wanna do something and I have never seen as many people as I have lately saying, What can I do? which is a really positive sign. What we've got to do is get, give, give people things to do that they can contribute. And I always say to people when they contact me, just whatever you do, remain optimistic that you can bring about change and always take some kind of action, whatever you're capable of doing. But I will bring it back to this point. Um, at the end of the day, it has to have a political pathway. Without, without political change, without influence in parliament, it's like, a, it's like a tsunami washing up against a cold stone wall. You know, it's just going to wash away and that energy is going to dissipate. I've seen it with the Occupy movement. I've seen it a lot of times over my career. Well-meaning, good intention campaigns that have failed. Uh, it's got to be consistent. It's got to be relentless. Uh, and it's got to be, um, it's got to be p political ultimately at the end of the well, day. Well, let's talk a little bit about that to kind of close things out. Um, you're about to go back to parliament, you know, and, you, and you've talked about distilling a message in the pub vernacular to, to connect with people. Yeah. Um, but what is it that, that we as young people should be looking to do? You know, you've talked about now a political pathway and making sure that that's tied to your actions. Yeah. What are the three things that as young people we can do to make sure we're making a difference? I think the, um, the, the first thing is... Uh, is continue to continue to organise, um, continue to protest, uh, continue to um, to share things online and, and, and talk to your friends and have have conversations. Uh, write to politicians, uh, protest outside their office if you have to. Let them know that you're there peacefully, of course. Uh, but you know, I think that that to me, the, the most important thing you can do is just do what you can do. And that's going to be different. That's going to be different for for every person. Volunteer, volunteering is great. You know, there's so many organisations out there that are needing people to help. Whether it's you know working with uh, animals affected by you know the devastating impacts we've seen of these wildfires, through to joining uh, an environment group, an, an NGO, joining a, so a social group, 
um, getting involved in a political party. Um, there's so many ways that you can actually take action and it'll be really good for you to do that. It'll really help motivate you and it'll give you a sense of worth and a sense that you're achieving something. Um, we used to call it clicktivism or slacktivism, you know, just sharing something on Facebook or clicking on a, clicking on a, uh, you know, a, a, a survey or a petition. Look, it's, it's great and I, and I don't knock that. Um, Organise a film night, you know, go get, 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 get a copy of a great film, book your church hall, get, get people out, get in a guest speaker and just start, just kind of start organising, start getting people together. The 2020s is going to be the decade of young people organising themselves as a, as a unity block and letting older politicians know that they're coming and they're coming for their pensions. If they don't act on climate, they're going to act on their pensions in 20, 30 years' time. They're, going to, they're the leaders of the future. The kids we saw on the Tarkon, I hope one day will be in Parliament taken over from me and I hope one day they'll be, you know, standing up and, and, and doing movies and videos and, and, you know, doing the kind of things that we're doing. No, like you said, I think it's, it's important to look at all this in a positive light, you know. I think it's very easy to become cynical yeah. when you look at all these things. But if you keep your eyes open, there are so many positive things happening around the world yeah. compared to you know, 30, 40 years ago. And I think this is really an opportunity for us yeah. to shift the narrative, to shift the mindset and to- It, it, it is. And to turn the boat around and make a big difference. That, that's right, Asa, remember to vote for the change that you wanna see. Whether it's Australia, whether it's the US elections coming up, uh, whether, it's, whether it's Europe, whether it's South America and Brazil, wherever, vote for the change you wanna see. The, if, if the, because, it's, a bit, it's, it's, it's actually interesting because politics is at a pretty low ebb and people almost feel like it's a bit of a waste of time to go to the polling booth, which is really sad because it's actually the most powerful voice you have in a democracy. People have to know that their vote is really powerful and it counts. And if they just focus on one simple thing and that is vote for the change they want to see, do not waste that vote. Respect that it's powerful and it can change the world. Um, and make sure you let politicians know that you're going to vote a certain way. And that they might actually... They might actually give you a good policy or a good a good win along the way if they think that it's going to be beneficial to them. No, now, that well, might you... sound cynical, but we've got elections coming up all around the world, and I know the Greens in Europe went from four to five percent of the the vote in places like Germany to nearly they're polling nearly twenty eight percent in a very short period of time. And one thing I know about politics is it takes a long time to change things, but when change comes, it can happen really quickly. So people shouldn't be, you know, they shouldn't be too devastated that these things are taking time, things can happen really fast when they happen. And I reckon we're, we, we really need that to happen. Well, one of the first things I think you said to me in one of our early conversations was, you know, it doesn't matter what electorate you live in, who your representative is, whether it's a swing seat or whether it's a, you know, blue ribbon, conservative or, or, or progressive seat, you must lobby, you must talk to your local candidate um, and I think that's something that you know not just young people but generally we forget to yeah um, and, and I think you know if, if people are listening that as a politician I can tell you if someone wrote if someone writes me a handwritten letter it's actually quite meaningful we get a lot of emails and that's fine but you know um, write, write to your politician or pick it literally pick up the phone and call their office and give them your name and number uh, and say can 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 Senator Wish Wilson call me back I really, I really want to see the Tarkine protected and I want to talk to him about it. Yeah. Um, that personal approach is kind of missing in this day and age and I think it's really... Sure is. People, it's a good start for someone, see how you go uh, and keep pestering them, don't give up. Just keep calling their office. Eventually you'll get a meeting with that, that MP yeah. because you, you, you've been persistent. They're busy people. Sometimes, you know, you just got to just keep knocking. Eventually they'll listen. All right. Well, last question, Pete. Um, you've got a chance to take any political leader in the modern world for a surf and then out to dinner and you get to take along one guest who's it going to be where are you going to surf and what are you guys going to talk about oh wow okay i'd have to go with my own country because that's 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 my stomping ground and that that's that's the battle that i'm fighting so um I, you know what i'd do Ace? i'd probably grab scomo um i'd i would uh i'd like to i'd like to to sit down with um, him and Albo, maybe on, on a deserted island somewhere, like you know, past a point in the Maldives where they yeah. they got they got nowhere to run, and uh, yeah, just take them out, sit on the board with them, and just say, "Hey, look down, fellas, 
this coral, this coral that we're sitting on is nearly dead. You know, not 90% of this coral that on this reef is gone. That bit of that plastic bottle floating past you, we can do something about that. We can we can fix that. If that was worth something, it wouldn't be floating around in the water. People would keep it. Why 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 don't we have a national container deposit scheme? You know, why 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 are we exporting coal when this when this reef is dying and and if your reef dies, your fishery dies. You know, there, there's so much there I'd like to say to him, but there's there's nothing quite like, I suppose, being in the being in the moment and being in the environment and being in the having ocean. something tangible to point out to them. I'm sure I could come up with lots of others if you gave me a bit of didn't spring <laughs> bit didn't spring. I'm some, sure some, you could some, some questions on. No, me. well, look, I think you know, as surfers, um, we're incredibly lucky to have that cleansing yeah. force of the ocean in our lives. I know for me, it's the thing that. I always go back to that, you know, keeps me, keeps me sane. It keeps, you know, my keel even. It stops me from tipping over. And, um, you know, the ocean is something that I want to, I want to protect. I want to fight yeah. for, um, you know, it is the blue beating heart of our planet yeah. without a healthy ocean. Yeah. You know, there is no healthy it's earth. the womb and, of the earth, mate. Um, mm. Thank you for everything that you do. Keep, Keep surfing. <laughs> oh well, mate. I've got to do a lot more of that, as you can tell from today. So, uh, yeah. keep speaking up yeah. um, and keep inspiring us. Oh, thanks, mate. Well, look, once again, guys, I'm just stoked that you came down to Tassie. It was only a short lap of a small part, but I think you got a you got a really good snapshot today of why it's such a beautiful place and why it's worth protecting. There's nowhere else on earth like Tasmania. I'm, I'm very biased, of course, being a Tasmanian <laughs> senator. Um, but it, 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 there's there. plenty of other special places around the world that need saving and I'm stoked that you guys have taken an interest and I'm looking forward to continuing to work with you and others, anyone who, who wants to help save what's, what's precious and we need it for future generations. Thank you, mate. Thanks, Ace. Good on you, mate. Cheers. I love that last question from Ace and I think I'm going to have to steal it from you, Ace, and use it on some of our future podcast guests. This conversation was recorded a couple weeks ago, and since then, there's been a lot going on. It's hard for us to get an exact story of what's happened on the ground in the forest, but what we do know is that the Bob Brown Foundation has really been leading the way to defend this area, including advocating for citizens' rights to peacefully protest the deforestation. That's actually been one of the tactics that people have used to stop protest. So kudos to the Bob Brown Foundation, and thank you for all the great work you're doing. Please keep it up, and if you're interested in learning about this, anyone out there, please go follow Bob Brown Foundation. We'll link to them in the show notes. They also just held an incredible ultra marathon through the Tarkine to raise awareness and needed funds to defend it. There are lots of great people involved, including some of our friends at Surfers for Climate. Check the show notes to learn more and follow this important cause. And finally, educate yourself on the global conservation initiative that is 30 by 30, which is protecting 30% of our planet by 2030. We at WSL Pure are working on a campaign to support protecting 30% of our global ocean by 2030, and we need everyone we can get on board and in support. Thanks again, Ace and Peter, for sharing your discussion with us, and to Woody, our buddy at Woodrow Media, for capturing it. You guys are all legends, and we wish we could have been there with you. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or give us a rating and a review. Feel free to tell us what you think by emailing us at oneocean at wslpure.org or finding us online at WSL Pure. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.